What's up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Joshua Berglund, a.k.a. The World's Mayor, and welcome to The World's Mayor Experience, Episode 5. Today is going to be epic. Uh, I have been so blessed to have already met Noah. I got to interview him probably about a year ago. And I got to tell you something. Noah is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And traditionally, the way I do broadcast is I don't do a lot of research. I don't plan questions. I don't do any of that. My first interview is really just a conversation and getting to know people. That is the case most of the time. In this case, because we're bringing Noah back for a second round, uh, we've actually planned questions. In fact, 21 questions. And 21, 20 of the 21 questions are going to get a lot out of Noah. Noah is one of the smartest people on the planet. And smart in a kind of way that he knows things that other people don't because that is what he is trained and his passion is to know. Like he is driven to know these things that we're going to discuss today. And we're gonna get into some really interesting stuff. I'm gonna give you an idea of some of the questions. Uh, other than his background and early career, um, getting into nuclear engineering, we're gonna discuss nuclear engineering today, market design, game theory, core disc, white paper, uh, we're going to get into some multimedia, and also we're going to get into some of Noah's future plans. And now listen, when you're dealing with a futurist, when you're dealing with someone that knows the future, knows where we're going, not from a prophetic standpoint, although maybe there's some of that involved, the fact is that with what he's doing, he's able to predict what is going to happen from a very, very, well, knowledgeable place. Um, it's <laughs> unlike people like myself that get these visions and we can see what's coming, all the little intricate details, they're not there. That's not my background. That's not my education. I don't know about it. I just see things and then I go after it. Um, that is typically how it works. Now I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble doing that, but because I didn't wait on God, I didn't wait on clarity. Is this the right thing for me? Do I really need to say this? right now? Do I need to share my opinion right now? Do I need to um, share my truth in this moment? Like some, I've made a bunch of mistakes doing that, you know, predicting the future and laying things out. And while I stand by a lot of things that I've said, the fact is this, I'm not even real sure what I talked about did any good, the warnings I gave, the, I, none of that. But when I talk to people like Noah, the information he's given is factual. It's based, it's backed up with factual information, real insight, real wisdom, because this is his expertise. So we're going to get into some really interesting stuff. And frankly, the reason why I had to plan these questions flat out is I'm not educated enough on what he does to be able to ask great questions off the top of my head. So I spent some time I did some research and I wrote a bunch of questions down. So you're going to hear me read from that uh, today, which is very uncommon. I may stutter a little bit because I do that when I read out loud. So just know that I'm going to read questions today. And that is new for me because normally I'm flying off the seat of my pants and we can end up in no man's land. So today's interview is going to be very structured, planned, and the reason for that is that you can get the most value and information possible from our guest, Mr. Noah Healy. And again, he's a great dude. Uh, he handled all of our juvenile questions really well last time, but I want to have him back and he is back and we're going to get into it and we're going to learn a lot together. Noah's an incredible dude and you're in for a treat. I want to thank everyone uh, who has supported the World's Mayor experience so far. So if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, uh, you're watching directly on the worldsmayor.com or even joshuatberglin.com or listening anywhere in the world on all of the, I think there's probably 20 something pl podcast platforms. I want to thank you. Um, our new hosting provider has been absolutely fantastic uh, because it's exposing our podcast to parts of the world that we haven't been before. And that's a huge thing for us. And here's why because the world's mayor experience goal is to help. 500 million people. Now, help is a, it can be a loose term. Well, our passion is teaching media literacy. 
but we are also passionate about helping people make sure that they have roofs, roofs, <laughs> roof, a roof over their head, a home, food, clean water, shelter, clothing, the, the right kind of help that they need. Like we want to be that resource. Our goal is to help 500 million people all over the world, regardless of your gender, regardless of your sexuality, your religion. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. We are here to help in whatever way that we can. And our goal is truly 500 million people. And I've shared my vision before about the, the world's mayor experience and what this is to evolve into. Um, so I won't spend time doing that now, but our plan, yes, is ambitious, but our plan is very, very doable. And uh, we need your support. So we can't do it without you, uh, whether it's just sharing our videos, whether it's commenting along, whether it's you want to volunteer and you want to be a part of it and help launch this tour. If you have experience with tours, uh, fortunately, I have a team. I have a team that's going to help put this together. Uh, they're just not started yet, but <laughs> that's a coming. That is going to happen very, very soon. Uh, but that's very exciting. But look, if you just want to be a part of it, if you want to learn, if you want to learn media literacy, if you if you have goals that you haven't reached yet, reach out to me. Yes, I have services. Yes, I charge for those services. And they are worth the money, I assure you, because they are underpriced uh, for what they should be. But that said, even if you don't have the money to pay for any of my services, I'm more than happy to work out a, an exchange with you. So value for value. And because there's so many different parts and moving parts, and there's so many different opportunities that media creates, but also, you know, it gives us a lot of different things that we can do. So we can find a way to collaborate together in a productive way where everyone wins. You win, I win, and then the world wins. That is my goal. So if you can't afford to pay for my services, but you are like really interested in taking your career to the next level, then please don't hesitate to reach out. So with that said, I am extremely honored today. The way we're going to do this, there's 21 questions. We're going to break this up into multiple segments. So what you'll see uh, through all the video channels and even podcast channels is you'll see the segments uh, broken up and then you will have one complete episode. I personally like long form content, but then again, I know a lot of you like the shorter stuff. <laughs> so uh, we're going to break this up in clips because again, I mean, there's so much wisdom here. There's so much uh, that's going to be taught uh, and I'm excited to hear it. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome a friend to the show, a friend to me and somebody that I truly, truly admire, Mr. Noah Healy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World's Mayor Experience. I am so honored to introduce to you, as I talked about in the introduction, Mr. Noah Healy, one of the smartest people on the planet, one of the smartest people I've ever talked to. And today is going to be a little bit different style of interview that I normally do in that I plan questions, 21 questions uh, that I feel are going to get uh, the most information out of our amazing guest. And I do highly recommend uh, you guys check out the last interview. It's called The Conversation with Joshua T. Berglund, Noah Healy, and Jessica Lynn. Uh, my bride had the opportunity to join, and we had a lot of fun. And it was kind of silly because I think Noah just kind of put up with our silliness and the fact that we really didn't have any great qualifying questions for him. But today, Dad Gummit, I'm prepared and I've got a lot of questions and I'm ready to pick his brain. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man of the hour or however long this takes, Mr. Noah Healy. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's great seeing you again. It's good to see you. Uh, this question doesn't count in the 21 questions, but I would love to know, what are you grateful for today and why? Uh, well, some of the last time, actually, I'm, I'm grateful that we, I'm on schedule. Uh, I very nearly wasn't, uh, so, so that's, that's always good. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, as I mentioned to you, I just had a, a fun conversation with a, a new friend and, uh, have an opportunity to learn more about a branch of mathematics that I've never really 
been able to get a lot of purchase on. Um, he, he's, he recommended some books that he loaned to me. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful to have sort of a new opportunity to learn new things. That's actually exciting. I'm grateful for that as well, because not only do I get to learn from you today, I have discovered several new things that I get to learn and am learning. And it's awesome. Like I, I feel so blessed to be 44 years old and still have a hunger to learn and having basically information at our fingertips. Not that all of it's good information, but <laughs> there is still information to be found and uh, we have the opportunity to learn, which is exciting. So I'm ready to get into these questions. Uh, as I told you before, these are planned. So if I stutter while reading, you all can make fun of me. That's fine. Uh, but I purposefully wrote these down because, again, I I want clear questions and I, I want to be efficient, but also just get the most out of Noah because he is a wealth of information. So, Noah, you ready? Sure. All right, man. So can you tell us a bit more about your journey from training in nuclear engineering to working in tech startups during the dot-com boom? Uh, well, I mean, it was it was sort of a long accidental process that had some twists and turns, but it, there's not much to it at the end of the day. So I wound up in nuclear engineering because there was this really good professor that I was sort of following to the classes he was teaching and he was in the nuclear engineering department um he was the dean of undergraduate engineering students at the time that i was attending uva and they were winding down the the nuclear engineering department so there weren't very many classes in the department but they still had a few and as the dean he was teaching them and he was a good teacher and i, I was basically following good teachers into their subjects. And that that got me on the road down nuclear engineering. Uh, in terms of getting into tech startups, it was a different road. Uh, UVA had a, a strategic board game club. Uh, I, I wandered in one night, found these guys, uh, most of whom weren't students, they actually needed a student and the student that they had was a grad student at the time. And so they basically adopted me uh, and got me to keep signing the paperwork. So I was the president of the club as just about the only student for, for several years. Uh, but um, one of the people that joined the club after I got there was actually the CTO of a local tech startup. And he, like most of us, got very into a game called Settlers of Catan. Um, I think the first four or maybe six national champions actually were members of the club because we started playing Settlers of Catan. Uh, one of our members traveled the world and imported games as sort of a sideline. And so we started playing the game a few years before it was available in English editions and common in this country. So, you know, you got a few more years of experience. It's easy to beat other people. Uh, and so basically he'd been losing settlers to me for like two and a half years uh, and they were hiring. So he's like, well, you must be smart. How else could I be losing games to you? Uh, come on down. Uh, you know, and, and so I interviewed, um, and passed, passed the interviews and got the job. So how has that background influenced your, your current work? Well, the, the thing that sort of bounced me into and out of different approaches in engineering um, was was not really having a plan and so looking for opportunity and generality. And so the thing about nuclear engineering is that it is the broadest based of the engineering disciplines. Um, there's some mechanical engineering to understand the sort of physics of fluid flow in and out of reactor for cooling and so on. There's some civil engineering for understanding what goes on in site prep and shielding 
uh, technologies and the concrete that's involved. Uh, there's some electrical engineering because there's not much point in it if you don't have generators and transformers to to get out of the, the thing. And there's systems engineering because you've got all these things that need to be working together and producing the safety and 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 energy and predictability that are necessary. And then finally, there's nuclear physics, because if you don't understand what sorts of elements and their properties that are being produced, what sorts of radiations exist, and so on, then you don't actually know what questions to be asking and answering about those, those systems. Um, and all of those things have a wide variety of mathematical and computational disciplines that are attached to them. Um, so for example, uh, the mathematics of radiation detection is a relatively straightforward sub-branch of statistics, which turns out to be exactly the same sub-branch of statistics that one should master for website analysis and detection, because events on the internet are fully characterizable uh randomly distributed mostly uh through queuing systems uh uh types of systems and so just like you can create isolated measurements where you will precisely duplicate mathematical curves of general of a general nature uh so-called Poisson distributions um, when determining how many gamma rays a sample of radiation is turned off, you can do precisely the same thing and generate exactly the same curves, determining how many people are simultaneously trying to access your website, uh, which features on a web page are or are not being accessed, and so on. God! I'm so glad I wrote down questions because I, I I mean, I should be actually, I can't wait to go back and record that because now I have about five new words I get to go learn about. Yeah, I love talking to smart people and I love this. And again, even though what you just said is pretty much over my head, I'm one of those people uh, that like, I don't necessarily, when it comes to book smart, like I have to read it the book four times to like actually understand what's happening or even like a YouTube video. I got to constantly hear it over and over and over again to finally understand it. That has been my life. Yet I have this weird gift that I, the, the creator just shows me things. And then, now, then I go look. And then that's how I learn is based off of that. Like the things that I know or see or believe, they're not rooted in anything that came out of a book. And, and so, and it's like, when I speak to people like you, I, I'm just mesmerized by your knowledge and your wisdom. And it's like, God, I wish I could just like live inside your brain and understand it for a weekend. And I may come out much, much smarter. Uh, so again, I'm glad I asked these questions and, or, or I wrote these down because there's just so much to learn here. Like, I, I, I don't, this is not a plain question, but You've written a book, right? Like you teach courses, you teach people this stuff, or what are you doing with all this information? Well, that's the basic challenge. And the answer is, in fact, no, I have not written a book. I don't teach courses. Uh, that might be something that would be worth investigating if there was any kind of interest. Um, but the, the, the approach that I take is very much rooted in discovering and then applying basic principles over and over and over and over again. Um, and unfortunately, this is not common and it leads to a certain amount of mismatch. So very, very frequently uh, people sort of generate keyword checklists. Um, and, and so uh, somebody that was interested in, say, website analysis might have a keyword checklist of what whoever did write the most recent book or the one that they were convinced by said were the five things to look for. Um, and it's very unlikely that that person would say that the thing that you're looking for is understanding Poisson processes and and also understanding the breakdowns of Poisson processes. Um, I've only just recently learned about, oh, I need to 
I need to look this up. I'm, I'm, I, the, the name escapes me. Uh, Tracy Widom distributions, uh, is, is something that I'm currently sort of looking into learning about, uh, which is an active and open area of mathematics that we're not all that certain about, but it has to do with the limiting processy properties of infinite processes. Uh, so it sounds like you you are like the human version of AI. Is that accurate? Um, the, I mean, wait, hold on. Let me re, let me explain that statement a little bit. What I mean by that is not to be disrespectful at all, or but it, it it's that essentially what AI is doing with information and how it processes the information based on these principles, it almost sounds like your brain does the same thing. Is, is that accurate? Well, it's the other way around. Oh. Um, existing AI models attempt to model how human brains deal with information. There's something called associative memory. Um, uh, so I actually took an AI class back in the 90s and the technology is essentially caught up with the theory so that we can actually build these things now. But the idea at that time around these large neural net models uh, was that computer memory was very much an address-based system. So your computer has effectively a very big list of numbers that tells it where on a disk or these days much more frequently a computer memory chip system, where in that system the specific bits that you're interested in reside. So for example, when you go back to edit this talk itself, uh, there will be what's known as a file, which is essentially a pointer to the beginning of a big long list of bits. And when that list of bits is turned over to the right kind of software, it will reproduce video and audio of the conversation that we're having. So if you know where what you're looking for is, you tell the computer where that is and it goes to there and it gives you whatever's there. So it's much like, a well-organized library. Every book is on a shelf in a position. And if you have the card catalog that knows where everything is, you, you, and if you then to continue the thing actually had to know which card in the catalog you were looking for. But the theory is humans have this associational memory that we think about our dad. And then that causes us to think about, you know, the last time we spoke to him and what he smelled like when we were kids and and what his favorite meal is and when his birthday is and then maybe that spins out his birthday is also some other holiday and and we spin that out in our heads and then that has associations and so human associational memory uh is a lot of what enables our creativity our genius, our learning, and so on. Now, I am a somewhat extreme case because it turns out that I can't really remember arbitrary information very well. And so <laughs> I need things to have sensible associations for them to register on my mind at all. And so... I consciously work as I'm engaging with information and systems to make sense of those things in a way that is probably actually pedagogically beneficial for human beings. Like people should probably attempt to learn more like how I have to learn um, because it would build up these associations that would allow them to kind of see these connections between things. But the goal of present AI systems is to build into these, these machines, these associations. And so that's, that's the entire goal of the training is for not to say solve chess or solve English or solve art, but to come up with a way to associate 
terms and conditions that we can encounter. So here's a chess position. What's a good response to this chess position? Here's a proposal for an essay or a news article. What is an appropriate text to to match that news article here's a description of a poem or a painting you know give me a poem or a painting that that meets the needs of that description man well, that is amazing i again this is like this like the last episode we did i went back and i listened to it multiple times because there's just so much there um with that said we're going to take a quick break everyone we will be right back after these messages welcome back everyone we are here with mr noah healy and just absolutely blowing my mind i want to recommend uh, we'll have it or I actually want to say this we'll have a few more breaks coming up um, but it's a good idea to get a notepad and a pen because there's a, so much information here uh, that is just mind-blowing and if you're in media multimedia if you're a content creator you build websites uh, that last segment I believe is super super important and if anything gives you a reason to want to reach out to Noah and follow him it's a lot of what he just said and uh, really powerful information so I thank you for that we're going to get into tra your transition to market design and game theory. So what sparked your interest, Noah, in the mathematics of information and computation? Well, it it, it leads right into what we were talking about before. So I, I get a job programming computers. And I had a little bit of computer programming in high school, a little bit in grade school, actually, um, and, and a little bit in college. And I hadn't really engaged with it that much. Uh, it, it didn't particularly impress me, the kinds of applications that were generally associated with it. Um, I did I did work on a problem in that Tracy Whittem distribution thing is actually associated with that problem space. So I may be coming back to the problem of uh, distribution of selected uh, uh, distribution sums uh, again in the future, uh, but the Monte Carlo techniques where you figure out the properties of a big complex system by writing a simulation for that system and then running that simulation many, many times to see what the average or other sorts of you know, distributional properties of multiple runs of the system actually are. Uh, but at any rate, not not much to it. So I get a job and I'm programming computers and that engineering ethics like class kicks in. Um, you're a professional, you're supposed to know what you're talking about. And they they wanted they were doing some training with me. They wanted me to learn this stuff, obviously, so I could actually do the job. But I wanted to to learn this stuff. And again, what we were talking about before, I need things to make sense for me to understand them. So there were a few pieces. Uh, regular expressions are a completely elemental mathematical form uh, that also as arithmetic is to numbers, regular expressions are to character strings, just to give you a basic idea of what's going on there. Um, so that gives you a very powerful and general tool for parsing out and understanding text strings within files and so on. And that was very natural. But as we were getting into sort of bigger system ideas and other data analytics and other things that the computer could and couldn't do, um, I just started reading the internet. Uh, and as it happens, the papers that were written by the people that invented the algorithms and languages that our computers are written in and written for uh, are all public domain and they're out there. Uh, so I, I started reading those things as sort of professional obligation. Um, but as I got into them and started to understand what the the key depths were to what was going on and gained an understanding 
that allowed me to actually characterize and organize these things in ways that meant that I could actually think about them and remember them. Uh, the understanding that I came to is that computational mathematics and, and information is the mathematics of philosophy. And what these things are at base is imagination machines. Um, there's a concept called an interpreter and computers are physical instantiations of an interpreter. An interpreter is a device that when you tell it a description of a device, it, it behaves like the device you described. So imagine if you had an appliance in your kitchen and, and, and a couple of books, a book that said refrigerator, dishwasher, oven. And when you put the oven book inside this device, it was an oven. And when we put the refrigerator book inside this device, it was a refrigerator. And we put the dishwasher book inside the device, it was a dishwasher. Well, in principle, that's what computers allow. In there's there's a principle where we could build a physical machine that did precisely and exactly that. Um and it wouldn't just be able to take those three books. It would be able to take any book of similar complexity and become that device as well. Oh, gosh. Okay. So now, so I think the last time we talked about this and it wasn't necessarily that we disagreed. It was just a, a different perspective on the issue. And one of the things that you're pretty passionate about, from my understanding, is you know you want to build a better economic system, or you have a better economic system that you want for the world. And you know, there's a lot of rumors. You know, there's uh, from the Abrahamic religion side of things. There's a belief that there's a new beast system that's coming. Uh, there's the end of the world people. Uh, some people call this new financial system the quantum financial system, and it's backed by Nezra and Jezra. There's a lot of conspiracy beliefs around this new financial system that is people believe is about to be rolled out. They're, they're looking at the banking, they're looking at all that's going on in the world, and they think that this is the end, and now we're getting ready to have this uh, apocalypse of sorts. There's that belief system. There's people that don't believe in any of that. But the fact is this, we know without a shadow of a doubt, this financial system we live in now sucks for everyone, unless if you're elite, uh, it does suck, or you know the game, or you have some secret information or whatever. It just, right now, there's a, there's a world that is impoverished, there's people that are hurting financially in ways they've never known before, and it doesn't seem to be getting better, it seems to be getting worse. People like myself have a lot of hope that good things are coming. Like there's something good that's going to happen through all of this. I believe it. I believe the blessing is in the breaking. That could be a spiritual belief. I don't know, but that's what I believe. But you have an idea, a plan, a concept that everybody gets to win from at least the way that I understand it. So can you please share your vision for a better economic system that you are currently working on? Uh, absolutely. So you'd gone into a lot of detail there. I would say that my perspective is that this system actually sucks for everybody, even if they are elite, even if you're under the impression that it doesn't suck for you. Wow. Um, and that the issue, while there are many issues and people have a wide variety of beliefs, some of them are probably false. Uh, uh, <laughs> some of them, probably. some some of them might actually be true, uh, but but the problem that I can see and I can actually think about is that the core algorithm is actually broken by overcapacity, uh, and that is the core problem. And so the, the vision I see has to do with understanding finance as a part of a society. 
and the value proposition that it actually has. So the value proposition of a financial system is the communication of economically relevant information through prices. So if prices are almost universally known in ways that are dependably usable, then people can make the best economic decisions for themselves and the society. And if those, if that isn't true, if the those prices are not almost universally known or aren't dependably available, then people cannot make the best economic decisions for themselves or for society. Uh, this isn't controversial. Uh, multiple people have won Nobel Prizes from multiple points around the, the political spectrum for proving that this is the case. Uh, the problem is that the markets that we presently use to to get the most valuable of those prices don't work as the ease of communication improves through computers and, and computer technology. So you can think of it like a transportation network. If, if a country, if, if, if you have a society that cannot transport goods at all, there's no, there's no horses, there's no walking, there's no roads, there's no rail, there's no boats, there's no rafts. Everyone just lives on the land that they live on and whatever it is that's there is what they live on. You know, this guy eats well, but he dresses in leaves. That guy over there eats poorly, but, you know, he's got he's got some cloth on his back. Uh, you know, you can't you can't eat cotton, but you can wear it. Um, you know, this guy lives in a house made out of bricks and that guy lives in a house made out of wood. And that guy lives in a house made out of straw, not because they're the three little pigs and they're planning badly, but because this guy lives in a place where there's mud and he can make bricks and that guy lives in a place where there's woods and so he can make boards. Um, we move up one level from that and we have some kind of transport system. We have roads. Well, Roman roads, some of them have lasted for a millennia, but you could not drive modern 18-wheelers on Roman roads, even well-maintained ones, because they were built for horse carts. They were built for people to walk on. They were built for armies to march on. The weight and power of a modern 18-wheeler moving 60-plus miles an hour, 25-plus tons would tear those roads apart. And so if you're going to have 18 wheelers or trains or super carriers, you need to build ports, rail, roads that can actually put up with those things. Uh, the Panama Canal was an enormous advance in the speed that which people could get from the eastern and the western hemisphere and back and forth but modern supercarriers are so big that they can't go through the panama canal and so the efficiency that they gain from being enormous is large enough to pay the freight to sail around the bottom of south america or africa uh to get to the atlantic the pacific um that's that you know that's 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 the shift and deepening and widening the canal which is a thing that's happened on more than one occasion would would if if we continue to generate larger and larger ships would be a necessary change in order to be able to make those transport systems as efficient and functional as possible um so Going from our sort of long history of physical transport to intentional transport, so why the deals that would underpin the needs to make those trades, 
two people can come together and make a deal and they can make any deal they feel like about anything that they want. Um, that deal won't necessarily be uncoerced. And so it might not be that economically valuable. Um, but if they're both honorable, they make an uncoerced deal that's in their common interests. That's great. Uh, but there aren't two people. There's almost 8 billion of us. And we have collective interests in the production of food, energy, clothing, building material, and so on. Microchips. And yes. Yeah. And that collective interest is expressible through the price system. How much does oil cost? It costs the amount that it costs. That means that the amount that we want to buy is also the amount that we want to sell. If the price is too high, then we want to sell more than we want to buy. If the price is too low, then we want to buy more than we want to sell. So things like the gas crisis in the 70s happened because for political reasons, we did not want to let the price float. And so we declared that the price was lower than it, it was actually there. And so people wanted to buy more than there actually was. And then there wasn't enough anymore because we wanted to buy too much. Uh, you know, the reason we don't have gas lines now is that the price has gone up to discourage people from using it uh, because we're, you know, only going to make the amount that we're going to make. Uh, and so when Saudi Arabia turns off the taps or we sanction Russia or we come up with a brand new shale you know, extraction technique and and more flows out of the, the central basin, then the price can go up or down to respond to that and let people know how much they should buy, how much they should make, and so on. And those systems are being overrun by noisy middlemen, mm -hmm. uh, speculators that can, at very low cost to themselves, put forth propositions that for the most part don't actually wind up turning into deals, but which create noise that we all have to cope with in determining what deals we should be offering and what deals we should be taking. And people taking less than optimal deals imposes a cost on all of society. It imposes a direct cost on that person because you're willing to work for less than you could be, or you're willing to pay more than you actually could have gotten. Um, but because we have a highly networked system, if the people that are making your breakfast cereal are spending too much on, on the grain that they're buying, then you're spending too much on the breakfast cereal you're buying from them. Uh, and and since those people are then also buying, say, power off the grid, they're not spending as much for power off the grid as they should be, because if they were doing things properly, they'd be able to buy more and sell more at greater profit for themselves and use up more energy and hire more people to do those things. And all of these things mushroom out. So if you drop... Uh, you know, a pebble in a pond, you see ripples going out. If you take a clump of sand and sort of spread it out into the pond, the ripples start from each point, but start crossing each other continuously. And you get a much noisier pattern happening. That's where we are. Almost every single economic activity is the result of erroneous facts that were available to that person impacting all of the other people also engaging erroneously. Um, and that's the primary source of the financial disruption that we're seeing increase in frequency and increase in, in severity around the world. And one of the things that's driving a lot of these elite top down like hey we need to do these things so things will keep working is 
they're trying to find ways to keep the system functioning when what's breaking the system is its form. And so they are not in any real sense, new financial proposals. They are recapitulations of the old financial proposals in new clothing in the hopes that the problem won't follow, follow them. But since the problem is algorithmically fundamental um they're essentially just going to bring the problems with them and since they're also engaging the technology that's causing the problem um they're going to make the problem significantly worse are you hearing you talk the, the thing that keeps popping in my head is it's almost like you're making this you're not saying this i'm not saying you're saying these words but it's almost like you're suggesting that we are better off with an AI controlled system <laughs> or a centralized one program, one AI, one technology overseeing this system to ensure that man doesn't corrupt it again. Am I wrong? Uh, so there's there's elements of that that are reflective in my philosophy but that i think is a very bad idea to have about how to solve these issues mm -hmm. um i think where you're apprehending something core from my opinion is that we actually require a superior intelligence for our economy to function. Human beings are not intelligent enough to determine what price levels are on their own in ways that will allow an economy to flourish in a complex system because it's it's sort of a, a dog chasing its own tail. The faster the dog runs, the faster the tail is running away from it. Our intelligence as residing in our individual lives and brains and minds and whatnot is the problem. We are trying to figure out what the information is about our common interests. And so the more human brains there are, the smarter we are as people, the harder it is to figure out what our common interests are. Mm -hmm. And so we need a system that exhibits greater intelligence than we have. And we had a system that did that. Marketplaces, by aggregating human opinions and getting more than one person to solve the problem, could gather together multiple human perspectives in a highly efficient way. And again, this is a topic that multiple people have won Nobel Prizes for proving from multiple points of view around the political spectrum. That's what made markets function. The problem is that the psychological and strategic and physical factors that made that work worked when everything in the system was a human being. And that's just not true anymore. Mm -hmm. Because computers are also producing information that's part of our system now. And the information that they produce isn't smarter than the information that we produce. In fact, it's pretty much universally stupider. But there's a lot more of it. And so we need to have systems that can deal with the apprehension of these much, much larger data boluses and the much, much greater numbers of perspectives that are involved from having a couple billion people on the internet all capable of talking to each other or talking to the marketplace, which is the important part. Um, and that's where having markets that are capable of producing superior to human intelligence information would give us enormously greater benefits than we got from the 
much stupider but still smarter than us markets that we used to have but we don't have anymore um and and so to that extent you you can use the words artificial intelligence because the market isn't a person it is an artificial tool that we're using that's driving human interest and ingenuity and and intellect and knowledge to produce knowledge that is broadly useful and more broadly useful than any one of us can produce. So the term artificial intelligence is semantically broad enough that it could include that. Uh, but systems that can encompass the economic interests of their participants and promulgate that is, as far as we can tell, absolutely necessary to the production and maintenance of complex society. And complex society is the only reason 7 billion of us are alive because, you know, human population maxed out a little below a billion with medieval levels of technology. Uh, so in the absence of complex society, we are looking at not mega deaths, but giga deaths. Uh, and I think that it's, very much worthy to avoid that particular fate. All right. We are going to take a quick break and I'm going to process. <laughs> Man, you, I just I feel like you need to be advising some of the world leaders and talk some sense into them. I do. Um, sadly, I've been unable to make any of those connections as of yet. We got to figure out how to do that. We'll be right back. This. All right, we are back with the man of the hour. Actually, I think we're going to go longer than an hour, and it's worth every second of it. I have really enjoyed this. I feel like I'm I'm learning a lot, and I have a lot to learn at the same time, which is exciting because, well, this information is available, and we all get to learn, and it really feels like. To me, the heart behind all of this is, I mean, it all, again, I, I brought up the question about AI, and it's almost robotic in nature what you're speaking about, yet it's very human. And I like that balance because, you know, I've talked to other people that are just, well, they're transhumanist, and, and they're, <laughs> they're all for the singularity and merging with technology and going that direction it seems like your solutions, even though they feel so technical, they feel so AI-ish, if that's even a word, it feels very human at the same time. Is that is that an accident? I hope not. Uh, <laughs> I might just not be smart enough to figure out how to dispense with humanity, um, but I I don't think I don't think that dispensing with humanity is a valuable principle to pursue. Uh, and so I'm not, I don't think about it all that much. And while my professional career and a lot of what I do is about figuring out what inanimate objects can do for us, um, I don't understand how to get past the divide of removing intention and desire and and spirit and ideas and creativity and culture and that kind of thing from a human system. Um, and so the people who have political or technological or cultural proposals that if humans aren't involved and there aren't any problems anymore, uh, I, 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 I'm uninterested in being on their death lists. Uh, and so, <laughs> so I just can't get there myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I think that, uh, you know, if we ever get stuck in a real life Terminator situation, I think I'm going to go to you. Uh, you're you're going to be my go to guy to figure out the solution for this problem. 
Uh, but, you know, patent work and commodity market design is an area of expertise for you. So I'd love to know about your patent work for better commodity design or the uh, commodity market design. Also want to learn about how your approach to commodity market design differs from traditional models. And also want to know about the challenges you face while working on this patent and how you've overcome them. So I rolled some questions into one. But I would love to hear just, you know, your your thoughts on that, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, um, the patent journey uh, kind of to take the last part of the question first, there's been a lot of challenges. Um, so the the first the first one I encountered actually was just finding attorneys to work with. Um, uh you do not have to have an attorney to acquire a patent, but uh, I think it's worth getting professional expert advice your first few times down the primrose path for anything. Um, and I'm pretty happy with my attorneys. Uh, I, I have other attorneys I'm also talking to. And in general, what I hear from everybody is, you know, what you're doing is what I would be doing, but man, it's really tough that you're going through what you're going through. So uh, first piece of advice that everything comes out is if you think that you want a patent, don't talk to anybody about it, mm. uh, except for an attorney. Once something's published, it's it's prior art and it can't be patented anymore. So if you come up with a brand new table, if you come up with a brand new commodity market, if you come up with a brand new paperclip uh, and you tell people about it, then it's over. No patent for you. Uh, so the first thing, the first thing you should publish about uh, your patent is your patent application. That is great advice. That's the same way with a, uh... A TV uh, show idea or anything else like you don't tell it get it patented to get or, or get get it copywritten <laughs> protect protect your ideas especially if they're original that's great advice keep going that's yeah so the the process as has been explained to me and i kind of stepped on their toes a little bit is that um the important part of any patent is the claims so there's uh, generally a fairly long section where you describe whatever your technology is and then you make a series of claims uh and those claims are what's legally existing so if you create a flying car and you put the complete blueprints of how to manufacture and fly this car in your patent and you claim uh painting it yellow then your patent will cover cars that are manufactured by that precise process that are painted yellow and won't cover anything else. So somebody that copies the entire process and paints the car blue, no coverage. Somebody that changes a single bolt spec in the process uh, and, and you know, then paints it yellow, won't be covered by the patent. Um, your claims are what's really important. And that's where the technical legal language that's generally accepted becomes very important. And the sort of basic strategy that exists because you want that very expansive description and they don't want to give you that very expansive description is that in your first draft, your attorneys will essentially draft you claims that claim the universe. Um, you come up with a new kind of, you know, couch, uh, and then I'll say claim number one, universe is the contain couches, uh, claim number two, you know, planets that contain couches, planet claim number three, the earth that contains couches. And by, you know, claims 15 or 16, they'll get into whatever it is that actually makes your couch different from every love seat that's ever been made. Um, so the patent office, it's the game. They know what they're doing. Um, They'll come up with some prior art challenges, usually, uh, and they'll say, if you've got something, they'll say, okay, these these claims down here, yeah, those are those are real, probably, but 
these claims, you know, up front here, we are claiming the universe. We're not, we're not going to let that go by. And so what you do is you take the claims that they're more or less signaling you that you can have, and you put them into the initial clauses with the broad language as a subordinate clause. So you're claiming sort of everything in the universe, but only to the extent that it's a adjectival modifier of whatever your actual invention is. So it's as broad as possible, but as specific as necessary. Um, that's sort of the first point of departure that I had. Um, there's language in my patent that describes the system mathematically, but the mathematical, the, the, technically they're called integral equations that describe that system in there and in the white paper are not the core broad system of possible marketplaces. There are other kinds of integral equations and other kinds of metric spaces that would also produce functioning marketplaces using my approach and sorry for the technical language, but, um, the patent office basically said, you know, this is probably, you know, these actual technical claims are probably patentable material. Do the usual two-step. My lawyers were like, we're great. This is awesome. We'll do the two-step. It's all good. And I said, wait a minute. Remember when I was trying to describe this to you in the first place and we got all this written down, I sent you a lot of letters saying, this is a very specific subset. I need this broader category of thing. And there's language all the way through the description about how there's a broader category here. I need that broader category because this is too narrow. And so we didn't rewrite it the way the patent office had signaled us to rewrite it. We rewrote it with broader language and that required a few more turns of the crank. Uh, the patent office came up with some prior art. Um, my my patent description uses the term paramutual slightly incorrectly um, since it's a positive sum instead of a negative sum game, but still paramutual is the closest English word to what I was describing. It turns out that there's a group of people uh, in something that they term the Lang patent that patented a something like 800 page long mathematical treatise where they patented every kind of paramutual game that they could imagine. And in, I believe it's section 8.1.1.2, uh, went on to patent every one that they hadn't already described that contained up to a countably infinite set of, of game systems, of, of uh, outcome systems. So if you're in a horse race, you can have the horses, but you could also have the exacta where you get first, second, and third exactly right, or the entire row exactly right. So it could be a lot more. But what if you had an infinite number of horses in the horse race? What if what if that's how it worked? Um, or what if you had the timing of every race and the finishing, you know, to the to the nanosecond or the picosecond of each horse that you got exactly right. So you could have these larger and larger sets of, of, of individual things that people could bet on. And so they, they claimed every set that was large enough that you could still describe the individual members of it. Uh, but they didn't claim uncountable sets. It turned out that that was a pretty fatal mistake on their part because my parimutuel games are from an uncountable set. So that finished off the entire 800 pages with basically a single sentence. Um, <laughs> so that was, that. those were the challenges that I was engaged with explaining to my attorneys what I was doing, um, uh, coming up with the counter examples to their counter examples to exam explain why the prior art didn't exist or wasn't relevant. Um, they've conceded on that. There is no prior art attachments to my, my patent, except for the things that they brought up as as pointing out that these things that look like they might be prior art aren't prior art because we've accepted that that's true. Um, but we got a notice of acceptance and then they violated procedure and didn't honor it. Uh, and then they came up with 
uh, what was, again, an incoherent objection. Uh, this particular objection essentially claimed that quadratic and subquadratic functions, to put this in the very basest possible terms, they claimed that one and two were the same number. Um, the mathematics behind that claim are rather deep, but there's a relatively famous paper that I had actually read when we were talking earlier about my deep dive. Uh, there's actually, it's still up, the C2 wiki. Um, I can strongly recommend to people with a real interest in computer mathematics, read the whole thing. It's fantastic. Um, but uh, it's a very early wiki project and it was on there back in probably 2002 uh, that I read a paper that is actually hosted by the National Institute of Standards, um, where in 1984, this guy programmed a Cray, which was the very famous supercomputer of the time, using Fortran, which is still widely regarded as a highly technical, high efficiency language. Uh, to sort a million items uh, using a algorithm known as bubble sort, which is not a great sorting algorithm, and then uh, used a common uh, sort of desktop machine of the day uh, programmed in BASIC, uh, which essentially doesn't exist anymore, but is very famous for not being a highly technical or highly efficient programming language. Um, to also sort a million items, but using an algorithm called quicksort. And the, the home available system using the crappy language outperformed the supercomputer using the, the state-of-the-art language on that task because quicksort is much better than bubble sort. And once you get up to a million items, uh, the advantage is approximately 50,000 X. Gosh, that's a lot to try to process. So, so I had to explain to my attorneys how to explain to their attorneys that they were wrong. That took a while, but that was finally written. Uh, they accepted that they were wrong and they re-extended the acceptance, and then they recanceled their re-extended acceptance a few weeks later. Um, and shadowy forces within the government is frankly the only way to describe them uh, are currently blocking the patent for no reason that has been described to anybody who's allowed to talk to me or my attorneys. And that case is being appealed to the patent board, uh, sometimes colloquially known as patent court, and it's currently scheduled to be heard in a little less than two years. Two years? Yeah. Yeah. All of this takes a very, very long time uh, at each step. It reminds me of the movie The Devil's Advocate. Uh, there's a scene where, well, basically the devil in the movie <laughs> is talking about why they're in law i mean it, it just remind i just i saw this meme recently talking about it and about how in law because they can just string things out string things out string things out and they have the power to do it and you're sitting here with something that can change the world for the better can do good for mankind and those douchebags are i would like to use a different word um are are slow playing and delaying things and make and try and basically trying doing their part to take any power that you have away from you. Uh, yeah, yeah, they've uh, they've stiffed my stiffed my congressional office. Uh, that that's a whole thing. Um, it reminds me of the the film The Trial. Are you familiar with that one? I have not seen that. Uh, so it's it's filmed in black and white. It's not super old. It is you know not young. It's Anthony Perkins. Um, and it's based on the play by Kafka. And the, the basic plot is that uh, Perkins is accused of a crime. What crime? Oh, he knows what the crime is. By who? Why would you need to be confronted? You know what you're guilty of. Just admit it. God, it sounds like my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually guilty. <laughs> 
And so he's the the film essentially is a you know dystopian nightmare as as he attempts to engage people who are acting as if they are part of a functioning society um, that is purely and wholly unjust based simply on his personal experiences, which sound crazy every time he talks about them, because what's going on literally makes no sense. Uh, it's like everything I read lately. Nothing makes sense and it all contradicts each other. And it's just like, what's the point? Um, it's like too much information is... is Well, that's no the precise point that I was making during the previous segment is that we have a radically higher noise level to cope with than mankind has ever had before because information sources used to be limited to human production, but we can now build machines that can tell us things about the world. And we need stronger institutions that can cope with that data stream um, and focus it towards human understanding and human needs and human desires um, because the universe isn't purely and solely constructed for the the surfeit of human needs and desires and and ambitions um uh you know within the abrahamic religions for example we're not in the garden of eden anymore uh, you know, not. we're under god's curse and we got to work for this now and so uh this is part of the work that we, we we'll have to do. And the good news is that we have these very powerful tools. If we can exploit them for our own benefit, there's a lot more benefit available for us. Um, but if we don't, if we just have these powerful tools lying around that we don't understand, um, you know, if you have, if you have a gun, you can hunt more efficiently than people who have spears. Um, but that doesn't mean that scattering loaded weapons into a kindergarten is going to result in them having better lives. This is something that I'm practicing right now because I am all for technology. I love AI. I love partnering with AI. I, I'm not going to, you know, I mean, at least I don't believe so now. I am not going to merge officially, knowingly with technology. I'm going to keep my soul and the way God created me um, it to and keep that intact to the best of my ability. That said, I still want to use all this technology. But one of the practices that I've had to install in myself and really focus on is avoiding distractions like finding that quiet place to be alone to contemplate to think to process to listen and to drown the noise out because i've been i've been kind of charting my my life recently and looking at where i go sideways where i i'm bringing too much noise in my head and 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 sometimes it's looking at my phone first thing in the morning sometimes it's turning on even music at this point. And I love music and I love to dance and I love to get in flow state, but I'm realizing that sometimes some of that stuff takes me off of center. So instead of getting clear on how to use the technology in a productive way or in a way that is beneficial to my fellow man, that is purposeful. Sometimes it's a mindless activity, just like scrolling, swiping, whatever it may be. So for me, I've had to almost go back to as much primitive thinking or as far as where there's no distractions, it's just me and the sun or me and the wind, me and the trees, no technology. And then then purposefully coming back in to use technology in a productive way that is not polluting my brain, causing me to go crazy, causing me emotional outbursts that are unnecessary, taking me out of center and so on. Um, so I love that you said that. Um, I want to take a, another quick break and um, um, oh, do you want to finish something? Well, so yes. So I, the, the part of your question that I had not gotten to was the philosophical and ma oh, material differences between the design of existing markets and my approach to designing markets. Um, so 
it's yeah i mean so getting onto that part of the topic um existing market design and this is conscious it's it's the term that they use is essentially micro design um so market micro design is is a graduate level class i've read a couple of textbooks on that subject uh, they're very good at what they do uh they're way better than the textbooks we give to like you know eight-year-olds to learn about social studies for example um but what they're about is adjusting the regulations or technical requirements within the context of the existing market design so to a large extent if you took the economic leaders of the renaissance italian city-states or the the dutch golden age or the pre-industrial revolution english um or the barons of the gilded age gilded age or the the traders of the 60s or 70s or 80s and showed them the modern trading system there would be a shock because in many cases there would be technologies that they had never seen before um there would be an absence of human action in in large parts that they would see as as important but if you sat down and walked through and explained what was going on they would get it because what's going on is exactly what has been going on for centuries the the structure of trade the way in which deals are made uh, uh, and promulgated is essentially been unchanged since as far as we know it was accidentally stumbled upon in italian coffee houses 800 years ago and so existing market design is entirely and purely obsessed with what governmental regulatory or policy changes or technological integrations can impact that structure without changing or destroying that structure's capacity to do what it does and i'm going to tell another story from my my history in nuclear engineering and it'll be a little boastful and i'm apologetic for that but it's it's you know it's apropos one of the things that we did in radiation detection is what's called the criticality experiment and so the idea is that we the students go into the control room of the of the research reactor and we pull the control rods out of the reactor and what we're supposed to do is pull the control rods out to the point where the reactor is critical that is the energy level of the reactor is stable over time um when it's subcritical it's giving off energy because the stuff inside is radioactive as you increase the subcriticality number that number goes up um if you get it up to critical it will be at a particular and stable level um it will be stable at lower levels than critical as well but if you get to super critical that number will start increasing the, the power level will go up over time and the way that the criticality experiment is supposed to work um is that we're supervised the actual reactor operator is sitting next to us sitting quiet he but he knows exactly where the critical level is and what's supposed to happen is that because there's essentially this exponential curve of power requirements and we have to actually turn the sensitivity of the system down through multiple step levels in order to get the sensors to give us information that's accurate what's supposed to happen is the students are supposed to blow through the critical level because at very very low levels of subcriticality there's virtually no difference between stable and very very slightly increasing and so the students are supposed to basically screw up go past supercritical be debating about whether or not they've actually gotten there whether the increasing values are because 
they're just at a higher level of subcriticality or whether or not they've blown through and whether or not they should keep going. And at some point, the reactor operator steps in and says, you're done. Here's where the critical point was back here. You know, go right up that you made a mistake. Now, we actually, they had me on Numbers Boy, and it turned out I'm pretty good at that. Uh, and so I predicted the critical point after a couple of runs. We had a couple more tests uh, because I basically said that we need to pull it out 18 inches. So we we did like an initial six inches just to give us a baseline. Um, the, the rods have roughly 10 feet of play in them. So six inches wasn't very much. And we were like, well, if, if we're going to try to kill ourselves right now, the guy's sitting there, he'll stop us. So let's give it six inches and, and figure something out. We did three inches. Um, like after six inches, I said, okay, we need another 18. We did three, then we did one and a half. Then we were debating doing one and and then we were like, well, we're going to be here forever if we're just like exponentially going down to not even where we think we're supposed to get. He'll stop us if we're going to kill ourselves. Let's just jerk it out to the, the level and see what happens. So we did that and the guy said, you're going to be a great nuclear engineer someday and then patted us on the back and we, we went out after like, you know, 20 minutes <laughs> for a scheduled hour and a half system. Um, that, that system, that, that idea where you can get focused in on one part of a system and be unaware of the broad outlines of what's going on is the problem that the micro designer people have. They are assuming that the market is perfect. And consequently, the people who are making money in the market are doing so because they're providing value to the system as a whole. And changes to the market that causes people who are making money to stop making money are harmful changes because since the market's perfect, the fact that people are, have been making money is the signal that what they're doing is valuable. And so when you make changes that don't involve the people who are making money making the amount of money they used to make, then those are bad. And so analyzing things from the, this point of view has essentially led them into sets of innovations that have accelerated the computational infiltration of the markets and caused a great amount of the dislocation that presently exists. My point of view is entirely separated from the existing financial arrangements and Soci sociology of those schemes, it merely regards the markets as information processing devices. Um, information processing devices that necessarily must interact with humans until such time that we develop artificial machines that can generate our own interests on our behalf, something that I'm not optimistic about, but People exist who claim that we will do that. Um, and if they are correct, and if we do, then our systems will need to be robust to that capacity. Uh, but this point of view of looking at it as an information machine and about figuring out what the value of information is rather than assuming that the information is perfect and therefore whatever's being paid for it is what its value is, um, uh, creates the, the sort of wall difference between what I'm doing and what everybody else currently does, uh, where effectively your income is the justification for your correctness. Uh, and so Bernie Madoff up until he wound up in prison <laughs> was correct. Uh, Sam Bankman Freed until he wound up in prison was correct. And there's no mechanism within the current philosophy or market designs that presently exist to make those distinctions. And while I don't have a mechanism that, that blanket destroys those two business models, um, 
I do have a mechanism that requires the demonstration of the value that is assumed to exist before the payment and the the carrot that is offered is that the payment is considerably greater than the existing payments structure is um, and so my system does a much stronger job aligning the interests of the knowledgeable and the clever and the cunning and the energetic with people that need to work and eat. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. Thank you for that. Let's um let's take a quick break and get into core disk. Uh, this has been all of this information. Again, man, it, it's it's so powerful. And again, some of it I just it's so far over my head. But you do such a great job of explaining it where, you know, it may be over my head now, but now it feels accessible to learn. And it feels like it's important information to learn because it it pulls out of it pulls me out of the rat race of what appears to be happening in the world, what I believe is happening in the world, but you know, based on my perceptions, then factoring the religious viewpoint as well. Like it, this, this information and what you're teaching and your knowledge base is like pulls everybody out of that to be able to look down. Like it's almost like you floated away from the planet and now you can see the whole thing laid out and like, okay, now this is how we go fix the problem. And even though I don't know how to fix that problem, this viewpoint that you have and the way that you see it, I feel like there's solutions built in all over it. So we're going to get into Core Desk, core desk right after this. All right, we are back. And uh, this has been, again, this has been mind-blowing. <laughs> I almost feel like you need a weekend retreat to just die like just to help people understand this because i believe that once they understand it it can ignite a movement it's just helping people understand and process this because it's a whole other language so speaking of that um i would love if you could just give us an overview of what what core disc is all about well core disc is to some extent very basic um we talked about the patent and how I'm pursuing that. Uh, IP is not sort of intrinsically valuable. Um, it requires execution to get it into the world. And so execution in the financial system means businesses. And the way businesses deal with IP is that they deal with other businesses. And so Core Disk is the business that I created um, as, as sort of the vehicle to negotiate the IP deals um, that would or will exist uh, uh, around this coordinated discovery market. Time out, real uh, quick. Time out. I, I want to ask you something because um, I, I, for the con, this this seems like this message that you're about to deliver is especially important for content creators is that true uh i think so um we're at a very special time actually in in ip and co for content creators uh with the the current you know strikes that exist uh something that many people are very confused by uh is who and how people get paid for intellectual work um and lots of people think that the music industry or the film industry, or if, if you, you know, have a more literary bent, the book industry is just codified into law that, that, you know, actors getting a piece of the gross or, or getting residuals when their television show goes on cable or whatever is just how things function. Um, and that's not even close to remotely true what the law extends is an exclusion of access um so 
going back, if you invent a brand new sofa and you get a patent on it, uh, that patent will allow you to stop people from using that sofa. Uh, even if it turns out that somebody sitting in their basement that doesn't know anything about you or your patent came up with the same idea and made their own copy of that sofa and then friends of yours introduced them to you at a party, you would be able to use, if, if that sofa turned out to have ultimately been built after your patent was issued, uh, and during the period of time that your patent was at, active, you could essentially contact the federal government and tell them to tell these people to stop using their sofa because you have a patent and they don't have a license. Um, but if no sofa manufacturer on earth wants to make your your furniture and you personally can't make the furniture yourself because you're not a woodworker or you know don't have the critical diamond supply that's in your sofas or whatever um you can't make them either and the government doesn't care the fact that nobody can do it well then nobody's doing it that's fine so this exclusionary access is what's going on. J.K. Rowling isn't a billionaire because every time somebody reads Harry Potter, they flip a nickel into her cup. She's a billionaire because her copyrights mean that you're only allowed to print her books if she's extended the permission for those copyrights. And because these content industries like books and music and film have extensive legal agreements that are mediated by these in many cases these these now striking guilds so if you personally just decided to make your own movie um without any sag actors without anyone from the director's guild without anybody from the writer's guild nobody could stop you from doing that you could simply make a film um but your actors wouldn't have residuals rights that were built into their contracts because those agreements don't exist they'd have whatever agreements you made when you hired them um if you you know drove down to the local jobs office and you know had people hop onto the back of your your pickup and and gave them 20 bucks for the day and had them sign a release waiver then then that happened um and so there's a these relationships are not fully worked out um and that creates a lot of difficulty for people who are inventors or content creators because unless you get into one of these these already worked out systems you will ultimately have to cope with the the business side of of these issues um i was i was, I was just uh mentioning to my dad uh one of my my famous entertainment industry stories of uh the guy who wrote the book that rambo is based on um the book did relatively well it got optioned by hollywood and so he hired an entertainment lawyer to to deal with contract negotiations and the negotiations got rather hung up on the point of sequels and he didn't want to contest it it had been going on he was you know upset about business issues didn't want to cope with this he was a writer and he said what sequels the end of the book is that the guy dies um you know they there can't be sequels why do i need to have something in this contract that they don't want to give me that gives me rights to these sequels when the character's dead at the end of the movie and the lawyer said in hollywood if it makes money there's going to be a sequel you hired me for my expertise you know you can fire me but you can't sign a contract while i'm your attorney that doesn't give you the rights to the sequels. Um, and of course, there's been five or six or whatever Rambo movies. Um, Increase. And, <laughs> it's been right. Yeah. Well, 
he didn't he didn't write the basis of rocky so he doesn't own those but the same kind of that same kind of thing applies you know uh, i'm sure stallone is making a few points off of the the creed movie that doesn't have him in it because he created that universe and that's how they put these things together um so so having a business as the as the entity to engage those negotiations and and deal with other businesses uh is effectively the way of the world um and so that's that's why a core disc um as as far as the name uh it's i got lucky uh coordinated discovery it's the first syllable of those two words and i just did a quick google search and found out that that's two syllables that people hadn't put together before um so so you know that was easy to grab um and uh and then i wrote a logo in logo actually i'd mentioned that i'd uh uh, done a little programming in grade school. Uh, that programming was in a language called Logo, which involves basically the ability to program a little geometric spirograph. So I played around with that um, and created a logo that symbolizes the algorithmic algorithmic simplicity involved by by uh, my company, um, and uh, and then that's it, basically. Um, you know, you, you pay the fee and, and you're good to go. Hmm. I want to ask you in really two sentences or less, if possible, um, I want to answer this question because I, you've kind of given an overview of it and some other questions, but what impact do you hope your white paper will have on the field of economics and market design? I, I'd like economics, which already recognizes itself as a practical subset of philosophy, to understand that computational mathematics having mathematicized philosophy requires economics to mathematicize its subset of philosophy. And recenter itself in in explaining systems in terms of objective reality and decenter itself from sort of the sociological apologetics that it it presently stands at where effectively people are explaining why it's either good or bad that people are either successful or unsuccessful. Hey. I vibe with that. I like this. Um, all right. We are going to take a quick break and we're going to discuss a subject I actually can add more value to. Uh, in our next segment, we're going to get into multimedia. We'll be right back after this. All right, everyone, we are back with the one and only Noah Healy. I think he's the only one, but definitely he is the only one that I know of that uh, can blow my freaking mind. This is this information is so well-rounded, uh, so valuable, and I just... I, well, it's I guess it's only fitting that we're segwaying seg, seg, seg to multimedia. And uh, you produced a video explanation and a podcast. How have these platforms helped you convey your ideas effectively? Uh, well, the podcast is a, a, a fairly recent um uh, experiment so we'll have to see how that works out and it's not specifically about my marketplace ideas i'm working with another guy named marty wiener and we're talking about broader impacts of ai technology on society uh and and he's 
particularly interested and enthusiastic about some of these ideas about consciousness uh, and things that we might be discovering to the degree that we might be able to create newly self-conscious systems. Um, he's very much in the tech world. Um, he's currently retired, but he was the CTO of Reddit was his last job. Uh, and he was a, one of the engineers that was, you know, in whatever the initial garage was for Pinterest. Um, so, so he's, he's got real bona fides there. Uh, the, the video, um, has had some utility, uh, so far in, in getting people's heads wrapped around it. Um, neither of them have really had a chance to go viral yet. Uh, but the, the major value proposition for both of these things in terms of getting my ideas promoted is the process of doing what we're doing right now. Um, uh, I'm fairly decent at explaining things to myself, uh, but that has led to, well, I was just having a conversation yesterday uh, with somebody that described me as too alien to connect to um, because I have these perspectives that are it's fair for me to use words that are similar to words that other people use, but the sense in which I mean them is frequently wildly different. And and my perspectives on what's useful or useless or harmful are very, very different because I'm not looking at the same thing that other people are looking at. And, uh, and so the process of working with other people to describe to them what I'm talking about and how to draw pictures that describe that and, and seeing what other people are understanding from my words and then adjusting what those words are to create better understandings um, either through the video or just in conversations with Marty or some of our guests uh, is, is, helping me i hope to reach back across this divide where i have i've trodden down this very different path that is i'm quite convinced still real um this mathematics is well known um so far no argument that i have put forth has has failed to withstand every serious challenge presented to it um, so, for example, the patent system, they have came up with five apparently prior pieces of art and have insisted on numerous textual changes to the patent over the roughly six year period where they were still acting as if they were going to give me a patent. Um, none of those changes have been material in any way to the patent itself. So the it is it is the case that the first set of claims as i described were expansive beyond the point of reason but from the second set of claims onward all clarifying language all adjusting language has been semantically meaningless um you know a subordinate clause that recapitulates sometimes in exactly the same words the dominant clause um well you know that's a that's a qualification of of no consequence basically, and those are the only kinds of things that that I have been essentially forced to concede. Um, I've talked to numerous people who operate within the marketplaces who have attempted to come up with counter arguments for how these things work, and none of them have been able to come up with counter arguments that they can claim stand on their own merits. Uh, one of my favorite and one of the earliest ones um, was a guy who had been a corn market trader. And after an hour and a half, uh, his final, his parting words were, I'm sure it won't work, but I don't know why it won't work. All of the objections he had for why it might not work, it, it, it answered all of those objections, but he was unwilling to credit the notion that there could be another way. Uh, and, and, 
simply his inability to see what the problem was was insufficient for him to to decide that there didn't have to be a problem um but that's that's that that's where those things exist they they give me sort of the the practice of standing in the ring and having it out and and seeing what kinds of objections and counter arguments people have what kinds of impressions i produce from the claims that i make and figuring out how to adjust those things so that the impressions that i produce from the claims that i make are similar to the claims i'm actually making uh and and how to answer objections in ways that uh convince uh rather than merely you know force retreat i i relate to everything you just said um because you know what i've been talking about through my various platforms and i've you know been kicked off of most of them and starting new again the um <laughs> for some of the things that i've shared in the past but one of the messages that i've spoken about is the importance of media literacy and you know because I believe with all my heart and there's so much evidence to prove and it's been predicted for the last, you know, I mean, God knows how long, but the earliest book I've seen it in uh, was over 50 years ago, was that we were going to live in a world and that where the, the power of the media used to lie in the hands of a few, it would be distributed to millions. And I believe that we're right there at that prefaces where at this that, that place in time where that's about to happen the trust in media is gone completely away and and yeah there's still some people that trust the media uh but that's changing more and more independent media is popping up new media is a thing media is accessible to people that don't have money like that's the thing is that you don't even need money to be involved in media and take advantage of what's available to get your message out. Now, some things get censored, some don't. And there's ways around that too. But what I'm getting at is the message of media and teaching media and talking about how it's accessible for all of us. Like all of us can do what an ABC, an ESPN, a CBS, any of those companies can do. We can, we all have that power in our devices to have multiple revenue streams, to monetize our gifts or talents or intellectual property, it's all there. So this message that I've been teaching for so long, I, it wasn't resonating with that many people, unless if they were a conspiracy theorist or they were somebody that had read The Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab or paid attention to The Great Reset or knew about the Internet of Bodies or paid attention to uh, the singularity, those, you know, from stories, books, movies, whatever it may be. And I've had to learn that... Yeah, I may be sharing this message, but if no one understands it, what what good is it? And I've had to recently find different ways to deliver these messages in a way that was digestible, less conspiracy feeling, but more based in reality, and find a way to dumb down my language to make it understandable where people can process it. And it reminds me of Michu Kaku. I think I'm saying his name wrong, but the physicist. He explains quantum physics like you're reading a kindergarten book i mean it, and again some of the information still over my head but he he speaks in a way that makes it kind of understandable for the layman and i consider myself a layman um so i see that you know we even though it's a kind of a different path a different message that we're sharing a lot of what we're talking about most people are either not ready for don't understand don't have the vocabulary to understand but one of the opportunities that we have, and you are taking advantage of this, which is exciting, is using the media to deliver this message and finding different ways to explain it and tailor it where it's digestible. Because again, I believe this with all my heart. I don't know if I said this when we were recording or not. I believe the information that you're teaching is the type of information that can start a revolution, but a revolution and a, and a good revolution and one that doesn't require bombing people and killing people and rioting and things like that. I believe that this is the right kind of revolution that you can start. So I'm encouraged that you're 
starting to utilize the media and get these different messages out and then having these conversations that you're having because this information is so important. I, yeah, I, I'm very hopeful that this is something that can happen in a way that is nearly universally beneficial. Um, uh, I, the, there's a, there's a, famous quote uh science progresses one funeral at a time uh there's there's a lot of attachment to the status quo particularly by those who are the leaders of the status quo um and where i see the problem lying isn't that they are bad men and women or incompetent not to say anything positive about any of them um, it's simply that the systems that they're operating uh, can't function because math doesn't work like that. So the sorts of media expansion that you're talking about and, you know, 50 years, I think Marshall McLuhan might be even 60 or 70 years, if you're familiar with his work. Um, the That's that's much much more information transfer than was the norm um through this pipeline um you know less of people's audio visual experience is what the path between their cottage and the place where they chop wood is than it would have been a thousand years ago and much more of it is what they can hear on a podcast or watch on a on a twitch stream or catch on a on a video someplace um and so that greater capacity to have language as as what's shaping your your information diet uh is exactly what leads to the requirement to upgrade our social and cultural institutions and our our daily lives and practices to cope with that difference um and we are going to see the systems continue to be overwhelmed and collapse uh and i've i've said this before I'm not sure if it's a podcast. Things are going to become however bad things have to become for the successful to abandon the systems that made them successful. Um, that could be the result of small groups of people developing entirely new economic societies that effectively don't need to reference them and function better. It could be ones that don't function better, but function at all, and and sort of the world can go to hell outside of them. So we have the downfall of Rome and the rise of Britain through industrialization as, as sort of two broad models of how we could cope with being incapable of dealing with the capacities that we now have. Um, and it's very much a choice. Uh, I'm very much trying to offer paths towards a choice of greater human capacity and understanding because i'm very much in favor of those things uh but it's not up to me um there's eight ish billion of us and while majority isn't going to rule um the current plan as far as i can tell is to have a dark age um uh, and unless at least well, for my system, at least a few dozen, but probably realistically thousands of people decide not to have a dark age, um, then we'll have one. Yeah, we're aligned on that. And that's a that that conversation alone would be three hours. So <laughs> I at least with tying in what I believe about that. And uh, but again, I. I am an op I'm forever an optimist and and I I do believe that I, I believe that we're gonna get hit in the face really hard with something. This is just my opinion. I think we're gonna get hit with a really 
brutal dose of reality. Um, and then, and then it's going to hurt like hell. And then, and then comes a time of renewal, rebuilding. And honestly, the word that comes to mind, not maybe purity is not the word, but a fresh start. Like I, I, I just believe that that's going to come and I don't know what that looks like. And I mean, I can fantasize and daydream about that. And, but I, 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 I do feel that there's going to be a, a dark age of sorts. And then from that, something beautiful will come out of it. But that's this to me. Yeah. All right. We have one more segment left. I am, uh, this has been, this has been awesome. This is fascinating. And I'm just really grateful for your time today. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with the final segment. And this one is going to be a little bit more uplifting, fun. And I mean, not that this hasn't been like, it's not depressing, but this is going to be a little bit more fun part of the conversation. So we'll be right back after this. All right. We are back with Mr. Noah Healy. And this has just been an absolutely amazing and informative con, uh, conversation and really just getting to hear uh, the wisdom and just this knowledge base that so fascinating to me and it just makes me want to learn more like every time i think i know something i realize that there's a lot more i don't know and so i love conversations with people like noah because i learned so much and of course now i have homework i've got so many pages of notes from this conversation <laughs> i hope you guys are taking notes as well so Noah, uh, let's get into your your future plans and and some of your vision that you're may may you may be willing to share with us. But I'd love to know what are your future plans for CoreDisk and your work in market design. Well, basically, I'm going to push this thing as hard as I can for as long as I can push until these systems exist in the world somewhere, uh, and then. We'll see what people do with them. Uh, but for me, uh, just looking at, again, the economics and the mathematics of it, there's there's no economic activity that people are engaged in or people have publicly planned to engage in that exceeds the value of fixing our markets uh, or repairing, perhaps, since fixing in in the context of markets has some very negative con connotations. Um, and so beyond sort of day-to-day -day survival, uh, I neither I nor, as far as I can tell, anybody else has any interests in anything other than getting this thing off the ground. So that's what I'm doing. Any uh, upcoming projects or collaborations that you're particularly excited about? Um, I have a handful of people that are trying to to build out markets that would incorporate the technology. The most recent was a guy I met through a podcast uh, that runs a a online farm sale community in East Africa, and he wants to build out a coffee index um, for trade of East African coffee. Uh, he's actually located in Switzerland, so presumably uh, an index for trading East African coffee to Switzerland. Uh, but uh, that's that's the most recent, uh, uh, you know, pickup, and I'm unbelievably happy and grateful that that he's doing that work. And that you, I know you've you've pretty much answered this question already, um, but I think it would be appropriate to hear it again uh but how do you envision the future of economic systems and market design uh i see it i see it as a a computational process so much like we would evaluate algorithms in terms of how much memory space or computer chip energy that they use up. Um, we would evaluate these systems in terms of their costs that they impose, both the the 
monetary costs, but also the opportunity costs that they impose on ourselves, uh, the degree to which they stabilize and anticipate, and and so on. Um, and what I see is systems that at the present time have cost structures that are roughly the same size as the growth rates of of explosive economies and those costs are being imposed on mature economies so a little history uh, in the post world war 2 era economies grew incredibly quickly because you know lots of people were starting from zero if if your company country was you know conquered and burned to the ground um then everything you do is is vastly increasing capacity but also america's economy was growing very quickly because suddenly global markets of people who had been reduced to nothing were available as as what's going on so in the post war period we see sustained 5% growth in the american economy that is spread around quite a bit it's called sort of the great moderation um and we see this this occurrence of a rising middle class and wealth even injecting into the working class. Um, as we get into the 70s with the major disruptions at the close of that period and into the 80s uh, with sort of financialization really taking off, that's about when computers join the marketplace. And we start seeing a acceleratingly fast boom bust cycle take place because the computers are essentially exacerbating the ordinary behavior of the market and causing them to become less stable, less cha more chaotic and more expensive. So the financial system as a whole is being more dangerous to play in, but also more remunerative to play in. And we see you know, the first people with $10 million annual incomes, $100 million annual incomes. There are now a handful of people who have, have clocked a billion dollar income to the IRS for a given year. Um, I don't think anybody's ever sustained that, but the, the, these are things that start happening. Um, that That's also slowed down the rate of growth. We now have 2% annualized rate of growth. And some argue that even that is being generous because we're undercounting our inflation rates. Uh, and so the true rate of growth would be negligible if, if that were the case. Um, there's every reason to believe that the introduction of markets that weren't costly, cost less than our present markets and behaved no worse than they behave, um, would essentially add their that that cost difference to the rate of growth of the economy. Uh, and since that cost is in the four or five percent range, that means that our economies would start growing as they did in that great moderation post-war period, uh, and not because the entire world had been reduced to nothing and we were competing with nobody, but because that's just how much economic gain was happening from the use of modern scientific and engineering techniques and computer technologies in agriculture, land management, mining, manufacturing, and every other sector of the economy that is presently being successfully skimmed off the top by a financial system, which is able to charge more money for worse services because no alternative to it exists. What books, podcasts, or resources have been the most influential in helping you shape this path that you're on? 
Uh, well, I mentioned one of them. Uh, the C2 Wiki uh, has an enormous body of occasionally amusing and illuminating, but also educational material on the founding of the internet and and how computation works and what you can do with it. Um, there's also something called the Turing Award, uh, which has an associated sort of after dinner speech and the Turing Award lectures are in general quite good, um, but a few of them are really stand out and they're, they're worth reading. Um, and so those, those, those sorts of influences are, are kind of the principal things that got me onto the road and thinking in things in terms of algorithms, computation and, and information. Um, there's also, I guess, a few other things I picked up along the way about sort of the importance of basic principles that, that I've seen all over the place uh, from introductory chess books to the uh, autobiography of John Madden, which I read once, to uh, the autobiographies of Richard Feynman, which I read once, um, or, or even uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, he has this notion of reverse salience and how you can do product design that way. Uh, but this sort of principle of principles, this idea that ideas, um, if they're coherent and true, then you can just stick to them and trust to them to, to get to somewhere else that's coherent and true. And this faith that that truth and coherence are valuable um, uh, it formed a large part of my, my life and journey. After I accidentally discovered that I upended all of economics and had a market system that was 300,000 times more efficient algorithmically than the one we currently use, um, I then did a lot more history and economics research um, just to figure out if the idea had already been had uh, and also to figure out how to talk to the people who were actually in the business. Um, and so in that context, uh, I, I read a lot of different perspectives of, of uh, uh, economic news sites, um, from you know real doomsayers like zero hedge to to very positive you know sort of cnbc type things um uh to sort of get a, a sense of what the marketplace is thinking about itself um uh rubini uh and what's the other guy's name the the anti-fragile dude um They've they've both had some mathematical principles that that are worth learning. Um, they're they're a little overblown, and neither of them have identified the system itself as flawed. Uh, so there's limits. Um, uh, but that. Those those are those are the main ones. As I, I'm not going to be able to remember the titles, but as I mentioned, uh, if if you if you like Google for market microstructure graduate textbooks, there's like three of them, and two of them are the ones that that I was recommended to read. So uh, you know those are those are there. Again, that doesn't get you to where the kinds of issues I'm talking about, but it does get your mind into the space of where the current conversations and state of the art are. But a great deal of my life and time is devoted to searching out the world for and integrating new principles into my outlook um, because I'm not enough yet because we don't have these markets that work. We have these, we have the markets we have that don't work. Um, and so figuring out what, what sorts of changes that I 
can undergo and adopt is is still the challenge in front of me um and that's that's sort of where i'm i'm working these days seems very human of you <laughs> uh, all right sure. you know there's going to be a lot of young people watching this um young people and even older people but for the young professionals out there that are still finding their way still you know plowing their roads they're on their own path they're doing what they're doing whether it's adapting with ai adapting with the new technologies any of that even or if they're just sitting in their parents basement playing video games i i, I think that a lot of what you talked about is going to perk up uh some ears and it may inspire ideas inspire a lot of thought so for those people what message do you have for them? I mean, it's like, what if you could tell them anything based off your knowledge base on market design, game theory, economic systems, what word of advice would you give? So I've been thinking about this because you sent me the questions. Uh, and it's not on a topic we've gotten to so far, but it, it, it threads through and it gets into what I was just talking about with, with principles. And, and sort of fundamentals of, of human action. Are you familiar with cargo cults? Sounds familiar, but I don't know exactly what it is. So cargo cults are this weird thing that's actually real. You can go look this up. Um, and there's there's a, a few phases of, of learning and understanding about cargo cults. And the first one is you can't believe that this is real. There are tribal groups in the Pacific Islands that worship naval air stations. Um, they These people's essentially first contact with complex society was the island hopping strategy of the American assault in the Pacific. And so they saw guys show up on ships, clear the jungle, put down these these sort of long strips of of hard land uh build a tower and then have things come out of the sky and land there and other ships come up as they built docks and then guns and knives and clothing and food came out of the boxes that they loaded off these things cargo these mysterious strangers called it and so they decided that that's how you prayed to God. God provided this cargo to people that underwent this ritual of building a tower and talking into a thing that's shaped like a radio mic. Um, and so they've created religious practices where they sort of have Gilligan's Island technology where they've got palm fronds and stuff that are shaped like a radio and they pretend or or pray or or ceremonially pray to god through their palm frond for cargo uh it's real step two is oh that's silly how primitive how stupid that's not the important step the important step is that's human that's that's how culture works. That's how cultural transmission works. That's how guidance works. People look at other people that seem to have aspects of their lives that though that you desire, and you look at what is an aspect of their life that you don't have that you think you can imitate, and you imitate that. Uh, and that is what where the financially successful have been doing for 800 years now. None of these people have ever invented a marketplace in their entire lives. They've never been educated by anybody that invented a marketplace. They've never talked to anybody that read a book by anybody that invented a marketplace. Because as far as history is concerned, nobody's invented a marketplace in millennia and and we know better than to use any of those marketplaces from 
prior eras because they're not as efficient and and useful as the kind we currently have. Um, as capacity widen, the difference between the people that are coming onto those islands as temporary bases to deal with the Japanese war machine and the people that live on those islands for hundreds of years as a base for hunting and fishing isn't that they're one of them's human and the other one's inhuman. The difference is vastly greater technological capacity of one of the two groups. And we are in an environment where exponentially increasing technological capacity has been a normal part of life for longer than virtually, you know, basically living memory at this point. Um, the, the, the computers that NASA was using in the 60s have something like a trillionth of the capacity of the computer that's in your pocket uh, that, that, you know, that you use to, to scroll through TikTok. Um, and so almost all existing cultural, political, business relationships are cargo cults that are being exposed as cargo cults, as, as silly, stupid things that only primitive morons could conceivably believe could possibly lead to success. And all of our successful people are successful solely because of that common belief. And for the people that are young, for the people that, that are young enough that they think they're going to be alive for another human generation, one by one, in some order, I can't even imagine what order it'll happen in, everyone will eventually learn that that's what's going on, because that's what's going on. Wow. I actually just learned about that. There's a place. Uh, it was. It was. Uh, was it about World War Two? And and it showed where the the towers, like the all the the military towers are, and then re wedge right in between it is this village of of true natives. That <laughs> so yeah, I saw I saw a little bit about this the other day, and I had never. I never really put any thought to any of that until I saw this documentary and it showed it where it was on a map and it talked a little bit about what you just spoke about. Man, it's so fascinating. Wow, that is a there's, good scare. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of other connections. Uh, my favorite one is that the there's actually a comic book character that's a god. The, the Phantom, the comic book character, aligns so well with the the sort of death centric uh warrior traditions of some of these tribal units uh that when they were exposed to the comic strip in in gi's lunch pails they seized on that character as an actual god and they paint their shields with the phantom skull uh in order to invoke his spirit and pray to him but I think an even more impressive thing is the the stone coins of the island of Yap, um, which are somewhat famous. There's a there's a they don't use them anymore, but they're still there. They they would go to a neighboring island that had a particular kind of rock, and they would carve very large stone wheels and then transport those wheels back to their island, and those wheels coins were used as the basis of their economy and the ownership of the coins was held in common knowledge among the colony without physically moving them so there are buildings where very very large stone wheels are incorporated as a wall and the ownership of that coin was originally the person that built that that building but because they then used it to buy things, the actual ownership of the wall of the house that you live in, which has been there for maybe a hundred years or more, is the guy down the street that, you know, sold a flock of goats for it to a person that sold 
uh, you know, his his boat who sold going all the way back to your great great grandfather that actually commissioned its carving in the first place. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows who owns everything. And that, as it happens, is precisely how Bitcoin works and all the other blockchain <laughs> protocols. <laughs> We're gonna have to have you back to have that conversation. <laughs> no, I uh this has been just so amazing i mean this is a book's worth of information that you've provided today you've so much value i am so grateful for you and um i would love if you don't mind please share with everyone where they can follow you where they can support your journey and where they can just learn more about you uh yeah absolutely so you mentioned uh i now have a podcast it's called the fourth age um there's, uh, I think, the fourth age dot substack uh, you can find. Uh, it's also on Spotify, Apple, Google, and several other platforms. Uh, I, I think you can search. I've I've been able to search for it and have it come up in the results so far. Um, but uh, but if you have any problems finding it, uh, reach out. Find me at Noah P. Healy at yahoo.com or uh, contact me on LinkedIn. I'm Noah Healy on there. Excellent. Brother, thank you again. Uh, I, I, I'm I pretty sure that we will do this again, <laughs> and I look forward to it. And I cannot wait to re-listen to this, take more notes down. I've got, I mean, just pages of notes. Uh, this is just amazing. So thank you very much. Wish you nothing but success. And just thank you for all that you do, man. Thank you. This was, this was fantastic. I'd love to do it again. Awesome. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. I come and never sleep on me. I saw my chains, you can know I go get what you're looking at. Food, no, I know, no, 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 you just keep on wonder, Tatiana Alice, but annoying memory. I just stop a bin, Danny have been, not in got a point seven four seven. I get weak, get ready. Like thought I wanna get in late. Jumbi head body, we ain't got a lot of time, man. Way be nice. Jameson hit the rock bottom. Eat a body, don't you money, do it, yeah, got him. Yeah, shot him. More than problem. On the cut, you get out of here, hell and now gone. Yeah. Some change, you can know it, go get it, what you're looking at Food, no, I know, no, 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 Find your comfort from another, yeah I got low like undercover, yeah Wanna know my name, Juji, I don't need him We a boy, but I beat him, yes You can even guess me, cause I'm baby High, low, low, watch you there, not like maybe Yeah, baby, let me welcome to my palace Tatiana Ellis, you just keep on wandering you just keep on wonder, Tatiana Alice, but annoying memory. I just stop a bin, Danny have been, not in got a point seven four seven. I get weak, get ready.